Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's ASA web seminar, Navigating the World of Assistive Technology for People Living with Dementia, which is part of the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series sponsored by the Administration for Community Living. We'll be getting started shortly. The slides for today's presentation are available on, under the tab on your screen marked Resources. And under the tab marked CE application here, you'll find information on how to obtain CE credit for this event. You'll have 60 days to complete a continuing education application, and it may take up to 30 days from the date of your application in order for us to process and issue your CE credit. If you are not logged in directly to this web seminar, that is if you're watching as part of a group and did not log in using an individual confirmation URL, you will not be eligible for continuing education credit because we have no way to track your online attendance. So if you'd like to receive CE credit, please be sure you log in using a confirmation URL you received after individually registering. If you have questions during the presentation, you can send those at any time using the questions box, and we'll save those for the last 10 to 15 minutes of this event. And now I'd like to welcome Sari Schumann of the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center. Welcome, Sari. Thanks, Betsy. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our webinar, Navigating the World of Assistive Technology for People Living with Dementia. As you heard from Betsy, the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series is supported by the Administration for Community Living. Before we start the presentation, Erin Long of the Administration for Community Living will provide a brief welcome. Erin? Hi, everyone. On behalf of the Administration for Community Living and the Administration on Aging, I just want to welcome you all and thank you for spending your time with us today to learn about this very important topic. We want to thank uh, Carolyn Phillips and Rachel Wilson from Georgia's Tools for Life program for sharing their wisdom with us. And with that, I'll give it back to you, Sari, and we will start our learning. Thanks. Thank you, Erin. So as you heard, today we have Carolyn Phillips with us. She is, a nationally she is nationally recognized in the field of assistive technology and disabilities. Carolyn serves as the Director and Principal Investigator of Tools for Life, Georgia's Assistive Technology Act program, and the Interim Director of Services and Education at the Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation at Georgia Tech. We also have Rachel Wilson, who is a Certified Occupational Therapy Assistant and serves as an Assistive Technology Specialist for Tools for Life the Georgia Assistive Technology Act program. She provides assistance to feature match individuals of all ages and all disabilities with assistive technology to enhance their daily lives. At this time, I'll turn it over to Carolyn and Rachel to provide their presentations. Thank you so much. Um, we are absolutely thrilled to be here with you today. Erin, um, I agree, uh, time is the most valuable thing we've got, and so uh, thanks to everyone for spending time uh, with us as we explore this important topic, um, definitely one of my favorite topics, and I'm thrilled to be presenting with one of my favorite co-presenters. And so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about why this is so important to me, but I was going to turn it to Rachel to introduce herself a little further. So Rachel? Hello, everybody, and you're one of my favorite <laughs> speakers and co co-workers as well. I, I'm appreciating just being here today. and. Yeah, this is a very um, important topic and a lot of buzz going around right now, especially um, in light of COVID. So um, we're very heightened at um, the opportunities that we can hopefully help today. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so for this topic in particular, um, whenever Rachel and, uh, and we were approached to, to present, um, I was like, absolutely, um, this, this topic is so important. Uh, I see this really personally and professionally. I am, am one of the many, many folks out there uh, in the United States, out in the world, uh, who is living at risk um, for Huntington's disease, um, which is, uh, you know, obviously there's uh, it's part, dementia is a, a big aspect of Huntington's disease. Um, my mother passed from it, uh, both my uncles and my grandmother, and so pretty much my whole life um, I have been uh, you know, shaped by, uh, I see the world kind of through the lens of um, first a child and then now an adult who has uh, helped navigate um, how do we make the world more accessible, how, what kind of technology solutions uh, can we use so that folks with dementia can absolutely live their best life. Um, 
the uh, when my mom actually was uh, officially diagnosed with Huntington's, um, we immediately went into action and uh, made their house, uh, their home, completely accessible um, and integrated all kinds of technology solutions early. And, uh, and then we have found that that's actually one of the important strategies. And so we'll be talking about that with you today, um, about the timing of all of this. Uh, this, uh, you know, having an hour is such a gift to be able to explore this with you. And just know that this conversation goes so much deeper. Um, and the solutions, uh, thankfully, are significantly uh, more than we had even five years ago. Um, it, I feel like uh, this is an amazing time that we're living in. Uh, I cherish every single day as a person who's living at risk uh, for Huntington's um, because, I, you know, I, I think that uh, there's just so much that uh, people take for granted. Um, so even as we're in the space of COVID-19 and any number of other things going on, um, I definitely uh, love being here at Georgia Tech, love being in that research space, but also um, getting research into practice. And so you're going to hear us talk a little bit about that and some of the projects that we have that are really focused on that. And so um, as we go through, uh, I'll be sharing some of my personal experience uh, and also obviously our professional experience, but I do uh, appreciate uh, everything that y'all are doing um, as we move through this. We're really wanting to make sure that you're getting um, the information uh, that you need that you can apply as quickly as possible. And we are very focused, uh, obviously, here in academia. We're very focused on learning objectives. Um, and so as we see it, at the end of this presentation, you'll be able to uh, define assistive technology. Um, you'll also be able to identify three core activities um, within your state assistive technology act program that you could benefit from, that folks that you serve could benefit from. Um, we also uh, hope and, and we're designing this presentation so that you could uh, be able to identify uh, and list three assistive technology strategies and solutions that would support people with dementia so that they can live uh, you know, as independently as possible. Um, a lot of times that is what this is about, is making sure that we're uh, helping people live as independently as possible and really supporting uh, the support team, the caregivers and uh, personal attendants and personal assistants and all of that. Also, at the end of this session, um, we are once again gearing that you will be able to uh, name five devices, hardware, software, apps that promote well-being when it comes to uh, people living with dementia. And so uh, keep these in mind as we're moving through. And um, uh, we definitely uh, are happy to uh, make sure that you have all of this information. Um, and then also know that there's a whole lot more um, when it comes to apps. So some of the solutions we're going to be showing you, it's more the family of that app, if you will, or the grouping, the category. And then we'll get specific. So we are here at Georgia Tech, um, and uh, we are within the Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation. Uh, we are focused here um, looking at uh, built environment and also virtual environment accessibility. Uh, once again, uh, that could be something uh, as complex as what um, my wife and I just did, which is redesigning our own house uh, to make it completely accessible. Um, and seamless and, and beautiful uh, when it comes to uh, allowing us to be able to age in place. Um, so it could be something like that, looking at uh, you know, living spaces, offices, uh, public spaces, public access. Uh, it, it also could be uh, looking at websites and making sure that they're accessible. Um, we're doing an awesome project right now with the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, here in Atlanta where we're helping them uh, look at, uh, one of the categories is uh, looking at um, folks with cognitive disabilities, um, which part of that is including uh, some folks with dementia, and making sure that we can minimize text complexity so that folks can, uh, won't have the cognitive load when they're trying to understand public health information. Uh, so there's a lot of really cool information, uh, research, and practice going on in this space. Um, um, we're also very happy to have our uh, Assistive Technology Act program here at Georgia Tech, uh, Tools for Life, um, as Rachel was saying. 
Uh, that is our Assistive Technology Act program. Um, our focus uh, is really here with the Tools for Life program to increase access to and acquisition of assistive technology devices and services, so Georgians specifically, but actually people around the country, uh, of all ages and all disabilities can live, learn, work, and play in communities of their choice. Um, that is not just a mission statement. That is actually something that we see manifest every day uh, through our work. Um, we are very much looking at how can we get um, strategies and solutions out as quickly as possible um, so that everybody uh, can get those solutions and be able to implement them. The Assistive Technology Act programs, um, and I'm going to give you more information in just a moment, um, but it is a national program, so every state and territory has an Assistive Technology Act. Uh, the other really cool thing uh, that, that we're working on that I wanted to make sure, and uh, Rachel wanted to make sure, that y'all are aware of is some of our research activities uh, where we are focused uh, specifically on what does it look like um, when you're aging with a disability. Uh, we have a, uh, an amazing partnership with the uh, University of Illinois and our partners up there and here at Georgia Tech, we have joined together um, on the Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center called Tech Sage. And that uh, whole center is really looking at technology supports um, so people can age in place with long-term disabilities. Uh, several of the projects that we're working on include uh, how does telepresence help people. Um, as you all know, that gets into telehealth, uh, which now everybody is uh, understanding and uh, becoming much more involved in. A few months ago, people were like, gosh, do we really need that? And now everybody's like, yeah, we need that. So. Um, so quite a bit going on in this space, and happy to give you more information. We also, and y'all are the first to hear this, um, Rachel and I and several other folks have been working on um, a, a database, an interactive database. Uh, one of the areas that we're specifically focusing on is dementia. And it is going to be designed for helping people be able to find solutions at any time of day, um, any time of night and just uh, matching people um, up with uh, various solutions. Uh, so there's a lot of computer learning, machine learning going on to, uh, built into this, along with smart sourcing and uh, predictive analytics. And it's very exciting um, because what we're trying to do is uh, get solutions as quickly as we can to all of you. Um, as a person who, for years, uh, I remember not being able to sleep, and. Um, staying up at night and trying to find solutions. Uh, and, and so that's part of what's inspired this project. And it's great to see this dream now becoming a reality. And so um, we're happy to talk with you in more detail about that as that evolves. Um, so stay tuned. When we're talking about the Assistive Technology Act, um, I've actually worked uh, you know, with the Assistive Technology Act for years and been privileged to work on some of the legislative pieces of this. And one of the things that I love about this public law is that uh, this statement right here, that disability is natural. Um, disability is a natural part of the human experience, and no way dimish, diminishes a person's um, right uh, to live independently, enjoy self-determination, make choices, uh, benefit from education, pursue meaningful careers, enjoy full inclusion and, and integration into the economic, political, social, cultural, and educational mainstream of society. Um, that uh, we actually put in here about the uh, public, uh, where it's found in the public law 108-364. Um, the reason why we want to make sure that y'all know that is that this right here guides a lot of the work that we do, um, whether it's making voting machines uh, easier uh, for people with dementia to navigate so everybody can vote, um, or uh, making, once again, uh, working with manufacturers and doing testing, uh, beta testing, user testing, UX testing, so that we can help design technologies so people with dementia can actually use them, uh, just like everybody else, mainstream activities. Um, and it's exciting to be in this space and actually have this written into uh, the Assistive Technology Act. Our core activities, um, obviously information assistance, uh, trainings, just like we're doing right here with y'all. Uh, and, and then we also do assistive technology assessments, uh, the assistive technology demonstrations. Every state and territory 
um, you, sh you do have uh, access to equipment within your state and territory. So make sure that you're aware of that, and um, we'll help you find your program in just a second here. Um, and then also being able to borrow equipment, trying before you buy, um, making sure it's the right fit. Um, and it could be something as simple as uh, making sure that, you know, um, these accessible cards uh, so somebody can continue to play, you know, card games with people, um, borrowing that and making sure that, yep, indeed that does work. Uh, it could be something more complex, um, like uh, making sure that, it, that an accessible gaming system or an accessible lighting system, um, and any number of other solutions that are out there uh, so that folks can actually borrow that equipment. Uh, we also have funding um, solutions and education because it's not just, uh, you know, okay to tell people all about solutions. Uh, it's, it's important that people can acquire those solutions and helping people navigate those funding streams. And then we have uh, throughout the country, um, and Rachel and I have worked on this for years, the National Pass It On Center, which is a, also here at Georgia Tech, and it is all about assistive technology reuse, and we work with all of your state and territories assistive technology at programs to get gently used assistive technology into the hands, into the homes, of folks uh, with, with disabilities, including dementia. So for those of you who don't know, um, and if we were face-to-face, -face, we, Rachel and I would say, uh, you know, who knows their API program and, you know, uh, uh, who's interacting? Um, so I, I'll ask you that. Um, you don't have to share with us now. Um, but we encourage you, uh, if you do not know your Assistive Technology Act program in your state and territory, um, or territory to go to the assistive technology, uh, as we see it, the National Center. Um, AT3 uh, is what that's called. And um, so it's the at3center.net. And you can get a bunch of information there about assistive technology, including uh, where your assistive technology ad program is and also how to get in touch with them. Uh, you can also go to our website. Um, we have all kinds of solutions, uh, as we said, that are designed uh, for you to help you get connected. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, people all over the world reach out to us about is that we have a vetted um, uh, app finder where uh, it's divided into specific categories, and it allows people to get apps, uh, for example, instead of uh, you know, here's a thousand apps for helping people um, with dementia who want to continue reading and need bimodal input. Um, it'll give you three apps um, that we have tried and that uh, we say, yeah, these are good um, and, and they're helpful. Uh, and so then that can help people uh, be able to read the paper. Sometimes it's as simple as that. Um, finding games, uh, finding apps for relaxation, uh, finding uh, apps that help people be able to shop, um, grocery shop, uh, get organized, uh, any number of things. So I encourage you to go there uh, and get um, that information and know that uh, also if you have apps that you really like, send them our way. Uh, we definitely want to make sure that everybody has access to that. So when we're talking about assistive technology, um, we are really talking about any item or piece of equipment that's used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities in all aspects of life, including school, work, home, or in the community. One of the great things that I love about uh, working with the Assistive Technology Act program is that uh, we get to serve all ages. So we see life across the lifespan, the way that it manifests and the, and the various challenges, but also the various solutions. And so uh, know that we're talking broadly about assistive technology, and so there's a whole lot that falls in there. Um, and this is a very true statement uh, about assistive technology. Uh, you know, for a person without a disability, assistive technology makes life easier. It makes life easier. Uh, you know, using your voice to be able to turn on the lights, um, having automatic doors when you walk up to them, uh, you know, having these door handles that are um, designed so that you can use different muscle groups like levers, right? Um, being able to, uh, you know, make a grocery list with your voice, um, being able to uh, have, uh, you know, sizes increase, fonts increase, uh, all of that, just um, 
All of those things make life easier for people. Uh, we find that all of these solutions that were designed for people with disabilities are now mainstream. They're incorporated into everyday life, uh, which is exciting. But for a person with a disability, assistive technology makes life possible. And that is very true. It's very true. Um, those automatic doors, uh, that's one of the things we installed early on in my parents' home because my mom could no longer uh, one, figure out how to open the door, um, but two, uh, control her arms and her hands um, to be able to have that fine motor skill to turn a knob. Uh, that was, it made life possible for her. Um, having commands where she could use her voice to turn lights on and off, and then that way she didn't have to hit a very small light switch target. Um, it just relieved a lot of the stress that was out there um, that she was experiencing on a daily basis. So. When we're talking about who we're serving specifically uh, with dementia, uh, you know, and nearly 10 million folks um, are uh, diagnosed each year. Um, 50 million people worldwide. Uh, it's, it's a huge number, as we know. Estimated cost of 18 billion um, when we're talking about uh, serving uh, individuals with dementia. And then obviously, um, and those of us who have been right there on the front line, uh, my, uh, both my uncles, my mom, um, it's families and friends that provide most of the care. Um, I was at the World Health Organization in Geneva uh, talking about uh, disability in general, um, working with them on several projects, and one of them is around this whole concept of dementia. Um, that was back in November. I'm really honored to be involved in that um, and looking at technology. And, and it's exciting uh, what is available and, and also what we can do uh, to make life so much easier for everyone. Uh, just a matter of applying the tools and being aware of the tools and also knowing uh, you know, what specific features um, and how do we match those appropriately. One of the things that we often talk about um, when Rachel and I are working in this space and trying to help uh, figure out how to match uh, folks with, uh, with assistive technology, um, we're often taking a holistic approach. We're looking at the whole family, um, but we see the person with dementia as the number one person. That's the person in charge, if you will. Um, but what we are striving to do is keep people off the fast track. Um, and when we say fast track, we're talking about frustration, anxiety, stress, and tension. Um, all of that, you know, really adds up quickly. Uh, I can speak personally. Um, you know, I, there are times that I had been on the fast track uh, when I was, uh, you know, as my mom was losing some abilities to do any number of things, um, put her shoes on or uh, get dressed, um, feed herself, brush her teeth. Uh, and so recognizing that and then also thinking about how can we wrap strategies, solutions, resources around each of those activities. So sometimes as uh, we're talking about this within this space, we're talking about functional limitations, and then we're trying to match technology solutions to each of those just to help people with that fast track and staying off of it. So aging in place, I got to tell you, um, you know, my grandmother was institutionalized uh, as a person with Huntington's. Um, and then my uncles and my mom all made a promise to each other that they would be able to age in place. Um, this was back in the 70s, 1974, is when I remember those conversations beginning. And we made a promise to my mom. And uh, I am so thrilled to hear the national dialogue um, and also see funding and see all the good work y'all are doing uh, to make sure that people can age in place um, as much as we can. And, uh, and just making sure that we can uh, think about things from that perspective. Um, you know, the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, right down the street from where we are, uh, they define aging in place as the ability to live in one's own home and community safely, independently, and comfortably, regardless of age, income, or ability level. Uh, when I'm doing, uh, going out into the community and we're working with folks, um, I've learned so much from Rachel, and I already know a bunch about assistive technology, but she sees this, you know, definitely from a different point of view um, and is always thinking about safety and independence um, and comfort, and, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that. We know the benefits, uh, obviously, of aging in place, especially with folks with dementia, 
um, it's maintaining independence. I think that sometimes um, people don't realize how much we really can help people, especially uh, folks with early diagnosis. I've had folks come in and they, you know, they're um, in my office and they're very upset and obviously very sad. Um, the stages of grief when you find out that you do have early dementia or you have dementia. Um, and often I am telling folks, you know what, it's a gift to have that information because we can, uh, you know, start wrapping solutions around you now. And, and what I have found, having been in this field, is the earlier we can start working on these solutions with folks, then a lot of times those things last. Um, and, and people can be independent longer. Uh, obviously, familiar settings, routines, um, healthier and safer environment, clearly. Um, better mental health. Um, I, I see it all the time, uh, you know, within our community of folks with dementia uh, and just finding that better mental health in general for the whole family um, and for that network and also cost savings um, when it comes to living at home. So there's a whole lot of benefits uh, and a lot to think about as we're moving through this. And as we're talking about each of those areas, assistive technology is wrapped into all of it. And so I'm going to turn it over to Rachel, and you're going to get to learn from uh, the fabulous Rachel Wilson. And so Rachel, take it away. Thanks, Carolyn. I appreciate it. And to kind of work off of what Carolyn was talking about, yeah, we're here to help. And you know, pre-COVID days and restrictions that we were, um, you know, we were able to actually go into people's homes and and do home assessments, or maybe have people coming into our office and sit at our tables and, and look at the AT Solution Lab that we have there at Georgia Tech. Um, but of course now we're at home and we're continuing to work and problem solve and, and try to seek um, answers or solutions to help people be able to live in their own home and, and live in their own home safely as well as independently. And so I've actually had more calls in the past couple of weeks um, now that everybody's kind of settled in I think with the whole telehealth um, opportunities and actually, um, you know, do a telepresence type assessment, if you will, um, where I get to, you know, get a peek into somebody's home and see what's kind of going on and then try to figure out some solutions that might be helpful. So in this illustration before you, um, you know, this is a common place. You know, somebody might be living in their home for 30, 40, 50 years or so and and over time, there's clutter that kind of just builds up that you don't necessarily realize or, you know, all the extension cords and the, the animals running around chasing after their toys or maybe the throw rugs or just things left in various places that have just always been there and you just kind of, you know, you don't necessarily notice it. But as we get older, you know, some of those things become barriers and, and obstacles, if you will. And so, you know, a lot of times we talk about just how can you, how can we make um, the environment as safe as possible so that, again, the person can actually stay in their own home as long as possible. The other thing that we talk about is the fact that when you're living with dementia, you know, it's, it's not a cookie cutter, it's not textbook type um, experience because everybody experiences so many different changes, whether it's in their memory, of course, um, their motor, their sensory, and even their, their language processing. And so we meet the person where they are, as well as the care provider, and, and see how can we make the, the situation as comfortable and easy and successful as possible with avoiding as, um, the accidents or the falls that are potential um, for that person to then have to go into a hospital setting or nursing home type situation. Um, I've done a lot of work of um, transitioning people out of nursing homes, which has been really amazing. Um, and sometimes, you know, having to transition that person out and live with their, their family members, it's a new experience. And so it can be very overwhelming, um, but I think just having the right tools in place and strategies um, can make that process a lot easier and less frustrating for everybody involved. So as we were talking about a few minutes ago, um, having a routine, having a schedule, something that is just a known fact um, can help, uh, you know, to make the situation of the day, um, the day-to-day -day activities a lot easier. Um, with Tools for Life, we, we do have low-tech to high-tech type technologies that we, you know, give opportunities to, um, you know, to demonstrate and show people that it doesn't require necessarily a nice fancy robot, it could be as simple as putting a calendar up on your refrigerator or in the bedroom to help somebody. 
Now, a lot of times people do have more challenges with the language um, aspect of, of their process. And so considering having some graphics, um, maybe put some graphics on the calendar rather than just the words itself, keeping it simple, but maybe um, you know, having those graphics might help somebody be able to get through their day um, routine. What I like here is uh, we've got some clocks and some visual prompts. Um, you know, knowing what day it is, 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 you know, silly as that may seem, you know, just even having the morning news on, Good Morning America or Today Show, whichever, and, and talking about, like, today's Wednesday, um, you know, morning, and, and just kind of going through it. But again, I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible, as well as um, using less verbiage or words, but using more of the, the visual um, components is, is a way to really help somebody um, understand what is going on. A lot of times, too, with the weather, um, you know, I've been using the Amazon Alexa Show. Um, it's one of the listening devices that actually has a screen to it. And what I like about it is it's a bimodal type um, is input for somebody. So not only are you going to hear that today is a chance of thunderstorms, but you'll see a visual component to it on the screen that will show you know, the clouds and the thunderstorms um, right there in front of you, which is really helpful. Uh, another solution um, that often I suggest is this really cool idea of having um, a clock. This one um, I come in contact with. It's called the Hatch Rest. And what it does is it has it's a clock. It also has a nightlight attached to it. Um, it has a sound machine so that you can actually have some soothing effects to help somebody get back into a soothing rhythm to get back to sleep. Um, there's also an app that's, a, that's associated with it because it seems like everything these days has an app, doesn't it? Um, but trying to have healthy sleep patterns is a great way to you know, function better the next day and so forth. What's also cool about this device is you can also set it so that it illuminates the room. So in the morning time, there's natural lighting that's, that's just coming on and, and helps somebody just keep regulated um, and, and have a little bit more awareness between the day and the night. Using a telephone, um, you know, as simple as it may seem, for some people it becomes more challenging. And we find very often um, it becomes a big concern, especially with family members, when they want to be able to, you know, hear from their loved ones and, and that person's not able to, you know, successfully um, make those phone calls. And so, um, you know, having various um, different kinds of telephones to have access um, has been really um, wonderful to be able to demonstrate the different um, resources that are actually available. I was working with a gentleman several years ago who had Parkinson's as well as dementia, and his wife um, reached out to me, and, and I got to meet them in person, and she was really upset or concerned because she was looking at it from the standpoint of the Parkinson's, that he was having difficulty holding the phone and dialing the numbers and so forth, and, and this person happened to have graduated from Georgia Tech, so he's a very intelligent, lovely man, I went to meet with him, and, and he showed me, he demonstrated how he was doing it you know, to dial the phone currently. And the process that he went through, he had to go through a, a homemade telephone book that he created himself to find his son's phone number. And by the time he picked up the phone and he dug out the phone number of his son and started dialing the number, the phone already disconnected or did that annoying beeping sound because um, you know, that was the kind of phone he had. Um, and so so frustrating for an intelligent man to recognize and realize that I'm a smart person and wait a second, I can't even dial a phone. It was very frustrating. And as we were talking about it, and you know, I had brought several different phones for him to try, showed him a few of these phones, and he loved it. It was so great for him just to see that he could make a phone call just with a click of a button. You can put the you know, family members, 911, whatever pictures that you want, have it already pre-programmed. Um, for him, we left the, you know, we went ahead and went with a dual purpose, you know, the numbers as well as the pictures. So, you know, on better days, he might just dial the phone number himself, or he has the option of just picking the picture of the family member that he wanted to call. So, really, again, as Carolyn was mentioning, the fast track, trying to keep off the fast track, he was able to successfully use the phone and and get on with the day, and it was, and his wife was happy too, which was always a good thing. <laughs>
So another uh, idea is um, using um, an alarm clock instead of reminding somebody over and over and over again. Um, could be nagging and you know annoying for somebody, um, but having something that actually can that can provide that reminder. Um, this particular device um, allows you to actually use your own voice versus a computer generated voice, which is not as familiar for somebody. And so this type of clock, this is called a reminder rosy, but it, it can actually program about 40 different types of reminders. So whether it's to, you know, hey mom, take your medicine, or hey dad, don't forget to, you know, um, you have a doctor's appointment, or it's mom's birthday, or so forth. Um, but you can go ahead just by using your voice, you can program it, and it can be in that familiar voice that um, is soothing and comforting for, for the person um, with dementia. I love this idea. Um, this is something that I think is, um, not, I would say almost relatively new to some degree, but um, having visual support. So again, with dementia, the different phases of dementia, um, the language com compartment of the brain, um, for some people, you know, have a, a big struggle with, you know, when somebody says, okay, dad, don't forget to go get your shirt out of the drawer, those words could be very confusing and not even processed. And so having a visual support system in place, whether it's in the bedroom with clothing or in the bathroom for your toothbrush and your hairbrush and your razor and so forth, um, you know, just creating these little um, supports and having them in place um, could be really instrumental and helpful for that person to be more successful. The other thing too is, you know, again, the language area of the brain um, is, is confusing. And so if you can think of um, trying to talk less but show more, um, it could be actually beneficial for that person and also less frustrating for everybody. Um, and, you know, again, you know, a lot of times associated things happen where your, your hearing is changing, your vision is changing, and so, um, you know, it, the experience could be overwhelming and also for that person, they're not even understanding what you're saying. So um, having the supports in place could really be beneficial for everybody involved. I love this idea. Again, you know, besides the environment, you know, thinking about clothing. How frustrating is it if you're not able to button the shirt that you've been buttoning for 60 years or, or what have you? Um, you know, you like to wear that dress shirt, you like to wear a pair of jeans, and it's just more complicated, cumbersome to, to manipulate your fingers on the different small closures. So having clothing that's actually adapted with either magnetic closures or Velcro closures or maybe just having your elastic shoes um, where you have a pair of shoelaces in there, but you don't have to worry about having to tie your shoes. Um, again, can just eliminate one more frustration um, for that person. Here's an idea. Um, a lot of times people don't realize, but the color um, can be a huge impact on somebody. And I've you know, there's some research here It says that Boston University has this research where people were not eating, um, you know, because they were just not stimulated or somebody would talk about how, you know, mom's losing so much weight and I don't know why and what have you. But having the color red is a stimulating um, color for somebody, especially with dementia or Alzheimer's. And so think about possibly um, switching it up and trying you know, plates and dishes and so forth using the color of red. Uh, another thing to think about too is a lot of times people will use white plates and, you know, those mashed potatoes and the rice, man, they just, they just get lost on that plate because there's no contrasting color. And so, you know, it looks like there's nothing there. And so why would, you know, you can tell mom to keep eating when in her mind she doesn't see anything to eat because there's nothing there, right? Um, so thinking about, you know, having the contrasting colors as well as trying to color red. And again, I love our program where you, you know, could have that opportunity to try something like this out and just see if it even works um, and see if it's successful for, for that person. So a lot of what we know is, again, the anxieties, the frustrations, and confusion that, um, that can take place um, at the various stages of, of dementia. And so, Using music is something that has been really comforting and, and supportive for somebody. Another idea is um, a weighted blanket, or in this case, um, this gentleman here is, is wearing a, a, a vest. 
it looks pretty stylish, if you will. Um, <laughs> it's a jean jacket vest um, that actually has some weights in it, and the weights are positioned in various spots that hit the um, pressure points, and it's based on the person's size and weight. But what it does is it really helps connect the brain with the body, and it just kind of soothes somebody, and especially you know, for somebody who might be anxious or maybe that person's about to go to the doctor's office and you know that that's a very overstimulating type situation, putting on the vest might actually help ease that person, settle that person down before having to go into that appointment. Um, again, music, um, you know, this particular music box is really great. You can just have the click of one button so it's not multiple types of buttons and having to really figure out how it works. Um, it's just an easy up and down type of uh, music player and it just works great. Um, fidgets, you know, we actually have created even do-it-yourself type fidgets where I went to visit a lady one time and we made a water bottle that had soap and glitter and, and some just fun things inside the bottle. And it was just, you know, a used water bottle that we took and, and made this little thing. And she took that model from me and just started turning it up and down and, and she was watching the glitter go from side to side and it sparkled in the light and it was just, you know, as simple as it is to watch her go from just sitting on the couch and she really wasn't engaging and she was kind of falling asleep. She took that model and she was successful and it engaged and gave her some fascinate, something fascinating to look at. And so, you know, little things like that, little tricks um, could really keep somebody, you know, engaged and, and feel like they've got some joy in their life. Another um, really cool um, assistive technology um, pro, uh, idea that we've been really excited about is um, these robotics and the artificial intelligence. Um, I don't know if you all have seen or heard about the dog and the cat, but um, we've been really using them a lot lately, and we're finding some great success with them. Um, they do have um, you know, artificial intelligence in them, so when you go to hold on to the, the cat and the dog, they actually will start purring or barking at you, or you know, they look at you, they turn their heads, they engage with that person that's holding on to them. And it just brings such joy. And if you could see the picture in front, you know, the one woman is just smiling and laughing and, and she's just so happy. And it's one of those things, again, um, you know, it's making that human connection with something. And, you know, otherwise, you know, the person, you know, can get bored or, you know, get ro roaming around the house and getting into, you know, trouble, if you will. Um, but having um, these robots robotics um, has just been really um, super cool to see. Um, we're also, you know, with the, the COVID, a lot of people we're finding, of course, you know, are, are isolated, unfortunately. And so having a companion of something of the, the dog or the cat, um, you know, there's low maintenance. You don't have to feed it or take it out, of course. Um, but it is giving that person somebody to connect with, if you will. Um, and so we're, we're finding really great success with that. I love this idea of finding different activities that, again, can help somebody feel successful and, 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 perp and find some purpose in their day. And so um, with this particular um, idea, um, there are several different size uh, jigsaw puzzles. Um, so this one happens to be a 63-piece puzzle, but there are smaller amounts as well as larger amounts, depending on um, you know what the person's able to do. But it's their lifelike um, type pictures, so it's not, you know, age appropriate. Um, and what it does is it also provides a structure. So it can help somebody kind of go along um, with their puzzle uh, making together. And then um, at the end, there's also some talking points that you can engage that person with in having a nice conversation after um, completing the puzzle. Um, you know, movement um, and exercise and anything that has to do with rhythm and music is something that is just so wonderful to do. Um, uh, before coming to Tools for Life, I, I was working in rehab, and oftentimes we would just play some music and, and try to incorporate that movement, music and, and movement in with our therapy. Um, it winds up getting people up and moving, whether it's in a wheelchair or if they're up, you know, trying to do some exercises. It's a great way to get the blood flowing and just you know, bring some joy again to somebody and, and better mental health. Um, I know a lot of um, programs are now offering chair yoga as well as Tai Chi classes and really seeing, seeing some great benefits um, in those different programs. 
Medication management is, is a huge problem. Um, and so one of the things that we love to do is be able to talk to people about all the different kinds of um, solutions that are out there and finding, again, one that matches with that individual or the care provider. Um, you know, depending on the needs, we will go through all the different features of the different medication systems, um, whether you need extra support of having a locking mechanism to it or alarms or maybe even having a visual component so that it will set off alerts and notifications. Um, again, everything seeming to have um, an app attached to it. So, you know, you could even, this, this particular device is called a HERO. Um, this is a subscription type of management system where you can actually connect it with an app and a family member or care provider can actually know if, that, if your loved one is actually taking their medications on time. And if not, um, you know, they can be an additional support. Um, so it was a really great um, opportunity. And again, it's, it's trying to figure out what are the, the features that are most needed and um, how, how can we try to find something that could be helpful, not only for the individual, but also for the care provider. I know a lot of times people have to take upwards of, I don't know, 20 pills um, a day or even more. And it's overwhelming to try to sort through all of those medications and take them exactly as they're prescribed. So having a system in place rather than going into a drawer and digging through all the bottles, which is very commonplace, um, or the Ziploc bags that I, I tend to find people just stick all their medications in a Ziploc bag. Um, having some sort of system in place is um, proving to be helpful as well as try to minimize any, um, any problems. Um, so again, we're looking at all different kinds of opportunities to try to enhance the safety. Um, and so this particular bracelet I found um, after, you know, many times hearing on the news somebody's out in the community, they have no idea who this person is, they have no identification on them, and it just, you know, caused me so much stress. So I really wanted to find something, and I, and I did find this particular ID bracelet where you could put as much or as little information about that person, put a profile. Um, picture of that person, all the pertinent information, information that you want to share or not. But again, if that person happens to wander um, or is unable to provide information in an emergency situation, at least that information is all there and can get immediate attention. There's so many different kinds of wander alerts and different um, opportunities just to try to help keep somebody from um, wandering, eloping, and so forth. Um, I just want to make sure we don't run out of time, but um, this is a great opportunity too. It, it has not come, it's supposed to come out in November. This is called a sensor call. This is something that is a great way, it's, um, it plugs into the wall and it's something that, um, you know, can monitor the environment, makes it, it has artificial intelligence in there, it has some sensors in it that also can alert um, family members to, you know, if anything is off. If, if, if the parent is not moving around at all, they can, the person can actually check in and, and voice call it. Um, it's basically a smart plug that has all these extra sensors in it. And yes, it does have an app that attaches to it. So, um, you know, if I plug it in in my mom's house, I could say, hey, mom, I've been trying to call you and you haven't answered. Are you doing okay? And she can answer, oh, I forgot, you know, I, I had it, my phone on mute. So um, it's just a great way um, to, you know, stay connected and make sure that somebody is safe without having the extra cameras and all those other things that my mom would not want in her home. Uh, staying connected. And again, you know, in COVID time, we're looking at all these different solutions. And we found that, you know, there are so many solutions out on the market these days. This grand pad. Um, it's a great solution where it's very simple, um, picture-based. Um, the person that sets it up, you know, the, the family member or care provider can set it up. And so it's, it's something that's specific to that individual. And you can keep it, you know, as simple. You can put as many um, things on it as you want. But, you know, keeping it as simple as possible um, is really helpful. You can make phone calls, video chat with somebody, play some games. You can play, you know, bridge or, uh, solitaire, what have you. Um, and then you also are limiting, you know, if, if your, your family member wants to, you know, access the internet, it's only the places that, you know, are, you're not going to get looped around and get into a rabbit hole, if you will. You can only go to, you know, maybe Facebook or, you know, whatever, uh, your favorite uh, website. Um, so it's very limited. Now the Amazon Show I talked about a little bit earlier. It's the same kind of um, device as the listening 
um, assistant, um, but it does have the screen. So as I was mentioning, you know, when you're talking about the weather, you know, you can actually have the visual component in there as well. I uh, love these ideas. These are um, some murals that you can place on doors to keep somebody from going into areas that could be, you know, hazardous, maybe stairwell or um, a workshop that has power tools. And so having, um, you know, these murals that you can place on a door looks like more of a bookshelf or maybe, you know, just it, it just changes the look of the door so that that person um, is disguising that, that exit area and, and doesn't escape or wander out the door and get into hard way. Um, finally, um, you know, the smart home technologies, they're all over. Everything is becoming nice and smart, so it, they're wonderful to be able to provide access to care providers, um, enable somebody to see who's at the door, um, you know, just be able to monitor. Or while you're helping your loved one, you know, in various activities, using your voice to turn lights on and off, or maybe play some music if you're finding that it's a stressful situation. And, and the person might be getting agitated, playing some background music, especially their favorite music, might help um, alleviate some of those stressors. And again, you know, AT, we believe, um, is really to help make life possible for everybody involved. And so there's a wide variety of, of assistive, technology, assistive technologies to help. And so we, we're always wanting, and help, wanting to help um, try to figure out what kinds of assistive technologies will work for, for anybody. So we do hope that you learned something new today. Um, we do have some resources available um, for you um, and our contact information as well at Tools for Life. We have a wonderful team. Um, we are a mixture of speech language pathologists and rehab specialists and assistive technology specialists and occupational therapy and, and just a wide variety. So we are always trying to find solutions. And, and, and as a team, like Carolyn said before, we work as a team um, and try to come up with solutions. And I will Great. Thank you, job, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, thank you both so much. Those were wonderful presentations. Um, we do have some questions that have come in. I want to get to a f at least a few of them while we still have some time left. Um, I do want to start with we've had some questions come in about um, cost. So how much does it cost for a home assessment? How much does it cost to get these devices? Is there financial support available anywhere? So, you know, trying to think of, you know, realistically how much of this is accessible to people um, and what, what they can actually get for their homes and for their families. And um, so this is Carolyn and um, Rachel, awesome job. Uh, and so I'm always learning from you. Um, and, I, and I already felt like I knew a lot. Uh, but uh, as far as cost, uh, one of the things that we have done, and it's a strategy uh, that we have uh, found that really works here in Georgia. Um, thankfully, we work with our independent living centers, and also, and we have uh, toolkits at every independent living center. Um, we also provide training um, and, and collaborate. Then also with our aging and disability resource centers and our um, uh, AAAs, our uh, Division of Aging Services also, um, led by Abby Cox here in Georgia, they're awesome. And so um, what we've been able to do is to get really creative and figure out how uh, to help uh, cover the cost for some of these. Um, you know, the most recent CARES Act, uh, thankfully our Division of Aging Services, they see the importance of AT, um, and so they are using some of that to make sure that we can help people um, stay at, you know, independent at home, and so that's one funding that, you know, kind of source that was out there um, that was a new one. And then also thinking about it systematically, weaving this into uh, different policies and different funding opportunities. Um, the VA has actually been jumping in, uh, Veterans Administration, in a bigger way, and been very interested uh, in figuring out ways to work together, and also teaming up um, and figuring out and navigating uh, piecing together all of these uh, different strategies to get the AT, but also uh, to do the evaluations at home. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to go about it. Uh, and, and also, um, the nice thing about teaming up with your ATI program and really having a win-win-win situation there um, by having a, perhaps a lab, um, it, it gets everybody more familiar. Uh, with the AT, and it's, being a pro it's a proactive uh, approach. Uh, so 
Um, we did that thankfully with Peggy and, and a bunch of our awesome folks down in Darien, Georgia at the ADRC there and it's just it's been out, it's excellent in uh, having uh, opportunities for people to uh, see, touch, experience and then and implement um, how you can use a lot of this technology. Great, thank you and so much. If I can follow up too, as far as sure. the home assessments, right now we, we are on a pause, of course, because of COVID, but we are doing, we do demonstrations and the demonstrations are free. And so, you know, when somebody has a question or, you know, wants to problem solve, um, you know, a couple of areas of life, if you will, um, we do demonstrations and those are free. So, um, yeah. Great, thank you. We had a few questions come in specific to people living with dementia and using devices like Reminder Rosie. Um, has there been any concerns with anxiety or um, other issues that people living with dementia might experience from having this, you know, voice but no person, a, you know, no person sitting with that voice talking to them? Or have you found those um, solutions to be effective? Again, the way I, I guess I can best answer that, I think it's, it's one of those answers where I say it just depends on the individual, honestly. Um, have, that's why I brought up even the Reminder Rosie, because it is a familiar voice. Um, and so it might be something that you can talk through with somebody, or I'm sorry, having that voice could just be that reminder for somebody. Um, and again, it would depend on you know the stage, if you will, of the dementia. Um, but the earlier on stages, I think, would be more successful with using a device like that. And that's where we will sit with somebody and just really sort out and talk through you know what's going on with that person to make sure that that is the appropriate um, suggestion to try. Um, but there's so many different solutions, and again, it just really depends on the individual where they are um, in the process. Great, that makes sense, thank you. Um, let's see, so another, um, another question that came up is, a, a few, they all kind of all connect, is um, has there been, is there anywhere where you can find independent testing of these devices that might say, you know, um, what they're best for or what they're most effective for and for which populations, or is that not yet, not yet something that's around? And if Karen wanted to answer that, this is something actually we're in the process of creating um, a tool that we're hoping that in the very near future we'll be able to um, have those kinds of answers to see what really works. So, you know, feature matching is what we keep talking about throughout this presentation. And, you know, how do you figure out what the right solution really is? And, and does it really work? And so um, we're working right now um, to, to actually create this tool that can help navigate um, all areas of life, your daily living activities, if you will, um, and, and at the end, um, we're hoping that, you know, we'll be able to share information and it will be um, uh, sourced out, um, what is it, sourced, crowdsourced, so that people can weigh in, um, you know, that the solution did work. And if it didn't work, you know, here's another suggestion. Um, that could be helpful based on, you know, some of these other criteria. So we're really excited and hopeful in the next couple of, uh, I don't want to say years, but hopefully very soon um, to have something like that available. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Carolyn, did you want to add anything or? Oh, gosh, no. Uh, you covered it okay. very well, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, okay, so I think that we, let me see if I can find one more question here. One, another question that um, came up is people are wondering what's the best way to connect with an occupational therapist or other therapist um, if you don't have a current connection to um, therapists that are, might be needed? You mentioned that's a website with question. the, yeah, that you might yeah, be able to look at. that's an excellent at question. Or, yeah, and I think it also depends on the state in which you live. Um, you know, there's a National Occupational Therapy Association website um, that you can look at, um, as well as, you know, talking to your physician and seeing, um, you know, if they have any referral uh, recommendations and referrals for certain practices in your area. Again, it's going to depend on where you live. Um, if you live in a more rural area, it might be more challenging to find some therapists. Um, 
but definitely, um, you know, they are out there. Um, and again, you know, our, our contact information is available, to, but if that person would like to reach out to me specifically, I'm happy to answer that offline. Great. Thank you so much. Yes. Very helpful. So I want to actually close yes. today. We're reach oh, did you have something else you want to say? Oh, no. I, I was just going to say this okay. has been awesome and uh, so thankful. So. Oh, great. Well, I think our um, participants have really learned a lot, and we appreciate everyone coming today to attend, and we certainly appreciate the time and effort that our speakers put in today, Carolyn Phillips and Rachel Wilson. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending our National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series. We'd like to invite you to join us for our next webinar on September 15th, which will be focused on the hospital to home program, dementia-capable care transitions, looking at better care and better outcomes. Registration is posted on ASA's website. I'm going to turn it back to Betsy for just some final remarks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks, Carolyn and Rachel. It's really, I just want to echo what a great presentation this was. Thank you for sharing all this um, information with us and with ASA members. Our pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Awesome. If you'd yeah, like to thank you so much. To use for if you'd like to claim to use for today's web seminar, you'll receive an follow-up email by the end of the business day that will contain a link to the CEU application. That email will also contain a link to download today's slides. You'll have 60 days to claim to use for this event, and it will take 30 days from the date of your submission in order for us to process and issue your CEUs. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>